Welcome back to Gold Derby. I'm Christopher Rosen. I'm so pleased to be joined by Jeffrey Wright, an Emmy Award winner, a Tony Award winner, and whose acclaimed performance in the new film American Fiction has earned numerous accolades so far this year, including nominations at the Golden Globes, Gotham Awards, Spirit Awards, Critics' Choice Awards. Uh, Jeffrey, congratulations. There's, there's potentially more to come on that front. I mean, how has it felt, I guess, to receive this kind of recognition for the performance uh, so far? Well, uh, uh, it's good. I have to say it's uh, it's a little overwhelming. Uh, it seems uh, seems a lot, but I, 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 I also know that it's better than the alternative, uh, which is to uh, have no interest in a role or a film that one does. I'm really proud of this film. Uh, I'm so pleased that not only my work is being acknowledged, but my colleagues' uh, work in this film is being acknowledged and the film itself. You know, we made this film um, in 26 days. You know, we didn't have a lot of resources, uh, but we had a lot of passion for this story. Cord Jefferson, our director, wrote a really wonderful, smart script uh, adapting Percival Everett's novel, Erasure. And we all wanted to be a part of this because of what he had put on the page. And uh, also after meeting him, he's uh, he's a wonderful guy and he was a first time director, but a wonderful leader. So we all came together, uh, you know, with equal passion for this thing. Sterling K. Brown, Tracy Ellis Ross, Leslie Uggams, uh, Erica Alexander, John Ortiz, all of us. And uh, we did it, you know, not to be cliched with a uh, with a bit of love. And so, uh, yeah, it's great that it's being acknowledged and great that audiences are finding uh, finding themselves inside this story in, in myriad ways. Yeah. I mean, the ensemble is amazing. You mentioned Cord. I, he's, the script is so great. I would imagine like, you, like you said, I love the film. I know he's a first time director. I, I've heard, seen interviews with him. He's so uh, open about how he was like a little stressed about being a first time director. Right. And like, kind of like maybe unsure of how that was going to be, or he's learned like worried about a learning curve maybe. And I guess for you having done, you know, you've worked with so many incredible directors in your career in such a long career. Was there, if not apprehension, like what were your expectations, I guess, for him as a first time director and then how did that kind of like how were those maybe changed or shattered having done it with him well it was clear from the script that he knew his way around story um and he's a clear communicator and you know he's he's uh one of the sharper knives in the box he was also smart in that he recognized the limitations of what he knew uh that was really helpful for him and for all of us because it gave us an opportunity to kind of play pulling guard for him a bit, not just, you know, we, you know, who were in front of the camera, but uh, everyone, uh, you know, all the department uh, heads, you know, everyone on the crew just really, uh, you know, um, understood that we were being led by um by uh, someone who didn't necessarily know where all the levers and buttons were on the set on first day and, and but cord is 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 as i said uh, a fantastic communicator and that's what directing is right he had a crystal clear vision for this film that galvanized us all and he's a wonderful leader you know, he leads with humility, he leads with intelligence, and he leads with a good sense of humor. So it was, it, this was one of the most enjoyable processes I've had working on a project. It was a project that uh, that um, built momentum as we went along, and you could sense that from the crew, who, is, you know, is always the first audience, that they were listening a little, a little more closely, that they were working with a bit more pride in in what they did and you know the you know uh, the silences on set got a little you know by degrees more silent it was just one of those that happens from time to time and you get the sense that yeah we might be doing something reasonably good uh and it certainly felt good but yeah and it was largely owing to cord's leadership does that give you when you get that kind of sense like more confidence in your performance and stuff too, knowing that it's like landing, like you said, like you can feel the momentum building that kind of like, it's just like an, an ineffable thing maybe or like, oh yeah, this is working. And like, um, does it make you more excited? I guess as well. Well, sure. As I said, I, I, I'm aware of the reactions that I'm getting on set. So if I'm tuned in, then, you know, generally <laughs> I'll get the reaction that I'm hoping for. Um, it, I don't think 
it kind of encourages me any more than anyone else is encouraged. We're bouncing off one another. And together, we're kind of, you know, building this, this deeper sense of purpose. So um, it just, yeah, it just, we all together kind of just pushed this thing and really got the script. We understood that this was a story that wanted to be told. We understood that it was timely, that it was uh, inclusive of social commentary that was relevant and that was being done in a way that's much needed. I think that, you know, some of the issues that we discuss or touch upon in this film are hot button issues now, um, have been for a while, but we don't talk about them well. We don't understand necessarily the language. We don't have a fluency in it. And they're urgent conversations, but they're often unproductive. This script was fluent. This script was funny, which made it easier to digest, you know, what uh, what we were on to. So everybody got a sense that, you know, that this was, you know, this was fresh and 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 uh, and 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 they they weighed in a bit more closely because of that. Um, but at the same time, I think the aspect of our film that centers on the family and this man and his relationship to love, love uh, of himself, love of the other, love of his mother, those things have such a human quality to them and such a universality to them that there was a real delight, you know, when we were able to do that. And there was just a, there was just a sense of warmth about, um, about our days when we worked on these, these films and, and joy that uh, that was infectious too for for all that were there. Yeah, it was good stuff. It was good yeah. stuff. It's yeah. good stuff. It comes across, I think, in the film. It's it's good. It's just such a good. It's such a good film. I, one of the things I love about Monk, your character, is I just found. I think there's a lot of ways maybe you could have gone and maybe like, or the character could have been like. I was thinking like, I was trying to think of comps. I was like, oh, maybe like in another version of this movie, he's like Jack Nicholson is in as good as it gets, or maybe he's like Gene Hackman in Royal Tenenbaums. But you play him in a way that has got so much kindness. I think the way that Monk responds, like the scene when he goes to the nursing home with, with his mother and you're, he's expressing kindness to people, even though he has got such a deep mistrust maybe of the world. And I just found it very nuanced in the way that you're able to keep his like goodness in there while also showing how he's just very frustrated with how stupid some things are about the world. And I guess like, how did you think about that in terms of your performance and like kind of really getting that nuance down? Cause I just thought it's like, it seems like it would be very difficult to nail. And I just think you do such a good job of it. Well, I think here's the thing. Cord talks about the overlaps uh, between his life and Monk's narrative in the book that he sensed that Percival Everett was writing a book just for him. Likewise, when I read the script and I hadn't read the the, the novel prior to that, there were so many ways in which my experiences as I was reading that script aligned with Monk's experiences. Cord talks about his mother having passed away a few years before getting the book and having to play, to play caretaker to her at one point along with his siblings. I'm an only child, but my mom passed away about a little over a year before I got this script. I was I had the good fortune of being raised by two women, my mother and my aunt, who's now 94. She came to live with me after my mom passed. So when I got this script, <laughs> I was in the midst of precisely the same familial challenges that that uh, that Monk is confronted with, except I was, you know, doing it by myself, only child. I think Monk wants to be an only child. So there was alignment there as well. But I understood a guy who is asked to be the adult in the room inside of his family. Uh, I understand the sacrifices that that asks on a personal level, professional level, level and otherwise. That was the stuff that really sunk the hook in me in terms of wanting to play this uh, role. Of course, I understood as well the external pressures that he felt from uh, the outside on a creative and professional level. He's a guy who wants to be 
intellectually himself, intellectually free and authentically himself and right from that perspective. And yet he's perceived to be, eh, uh, well, he's perceived as he is and what he is is uh, seemingly unpalatable to publishing world and to audiences. Um, so I understood those pressures, that kind of perhaps undervaluation of, you know, of who he was. I don't share necessarily his frustrations, but I but I understand them. And so there were there was a lot that I aligned with. So the social satire I saw really as kind of tragedy in disguise. Yes, he's the caring guy, but he's also a guy who carries around a great deal of frustration and pain, particularly as relates to, I think, his father might be another aspect of him that I understand reasonably well. So it's not that he's an uncaring person, but he's a bit damaged. Right. And he wrestles with love. He, but not necessarily to his mother. So he has one relationship there and another relationship with Coraline, played by Erica Alexander. There, there are these, there's there's so much detail that's written into his character and so much seeming contradiction. It was just a joy. It was a joy to kind of weave my way through that. But I have to say, I was probably able to slide myself inside this character with less friction than uh, than I'm used to, which is perhaps a good thing and an, and an unfortunate thing, considering <laughs> what a schlub he can be at times. But uh, but yeah, it you know it, there was just so much color to to work with, and it was on the page, and you know I just I just you know just played with it. Yeah, you're it's so great. I just think it's a very it's a great performance. And the other thing I was thinking too is obviously you're an acclaimed actor, like you said at the top. You won like a Tony Award, an Emmy Award, and all these different things. Uh, you have to play monk acting as the pseudonym, right? Stag R. Lee. And he is yeah. not a great actor. And no, I was he's not. Right. So <laughs> for you, how how did you approach those scenes when you have to like play Stag as Monk, who is a bad actor? <laughs> I just found it so funny. Well. There were a couple of things that I thought of while I was working on it. One, I wanted to make sure that, yeah, he was, you know, he was a bit stiff uh, <laughs> and self-conscious, but also that he was making commentary on what he was doing as he was doing it, particularly in the conversations on the phone where, he, where his mouth is saying one thing and the eyes and body are saying, uh, what the hell is this? You know, um, I actually... There are a couple of moments, for one moment in particular, when I thought of Gene Wilder. I thought of Gene Wilder, Richard Pryor in Silver Streak, in the scene in which they're in, late in the movie, they're in the train station, in the bathroom, Wilder's in blackface, and Pryor's trying to, you know, coach him. He's his hype man on how to be black. I mean, it's just it's a scene that we you know, probably would never be made today, unfortunately, but just the funniest stuff. You, I mean, come on. And I thought about that, you know, as he puts on this, this mask and, you know, walks into the, into the public for the first time that flashed in my mind, but also this idea of self-awareness and self-commentary, I think is akin in some ways to what a, performer named Burt Williams did. Burt Williams was the first black vaudevillian to make the Zigfield Follies. He, in some ways, for my mind, is one of the first great uh, performers on film, period. And a black man who played in blackface. But it was his version of the minstrel that he was playing. He was a brilliant guy. If you can, if you hear some of the music, these songs, just unbelievable. The lyrics, the subversive uh, quality of 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 these songs and of his performance. That he was aware that this was below him, but he was doing it uh, in a way that, if you pay close enough attention, you get that. 
He does a film called The Natural Born Gambler in 1916, five years before the kid. And if you look at Traplin, uh, Chaplin's Little Tramp and look at the character that he created in this, you can see, you know, that there's a connection between the two. He does a pantomime, Burt Williams does, of a poker game that is the most just impeccable thing you ever want to see. So I, I think, ironically, that there's like, you know, there's a bit of that hmm. in in Monk's version of Stag Arley as well. There's a dumbing down out of necessity, perhaps. Uh, he's caught in a trap that he's created for himself. He's created this Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster that kind of returns to consume him. But he he doesn't do it fully willingly. He does it in part because he has responsibility to his mother, but he's conflicted by it. And I just wanted to make sure that to the extent that that was possible, um, I, I made it clear that he was conflicted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we have to wrap up, Jeffrey. That's a great. I'm, I, I love hearing that. I love hearing you talk about this film. I feel like we could talk about it for so much longer because I think your performance is really remarkable and the film is as well. But we have to wrap up. Jeffrey Wright, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a great pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the time. 